Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Welcome, and here now, Corey Gomez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, Past, Present, and Future. Today, I am joined by one of my favorite actresses. I know her as China White from Arrow. You probably know her more so from Harley Davidson, The Marlboro Man. I am joined today by the lovely Miss Kelly, who thank you so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I have to ask the question I ask everyone, how, uh, at first anyway, how did you get started in, in the acting business? You know, I've always wanted to be an actor um, ever since I was a child. As, as soon as I figured out that acting was a career that like you could get paid to do. Um, but I never really thought that I'd have the opportunity to pursue it. Because growing up in Hawaii, we never had acting schools or... There were no, you know, very few examples of Asian actors on television, uh, things like that. So it wasn't ever something that I thought I would be able to pursue. But uh, I got into some modeling when I was young. I was I was about thirteen or so when I started uh, when I first got scouted for modeling, and then through that I entered a pageant. Uh, the Miss Teen USA pageant because I was told that I could make more money in Japan as a model if I had a title. And um, and so I entered this pageant and then, uh, I you know, all I had to do was win the Hawaii pageant and they would be able to use that to help, help me make more money in Japan. But um, I ended up winning the national pageant. And because I was able to, to, to win the national pageant and meet a lot of people in Los Angeles, and um, and uh, I won uh, a bunch of prizes and money, I was then able to to realistically pursue a career in acting. I think had, I, had the pageant not come about, I'm not sure that I would have been brave enough to do it. Well, one of your first roles, and I know this because I interviewed one of the co-stars you were in there with, so I got to watch it. The Dragon and the Angel episode of Twenty One Jump Street with uh, uh, Dustin Gwynn. Right. Yeah, that was one of my very first shows um, when Johnny Depp was still on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've talked. To that was a long time ago, and that's when people first started shooting in Vancouver. Vancouver wasn't the like you know the the northern Los Angeles, you know, the northern Hollywood like it is today. Um, but uh, but yeah, Twenty One Jump Street was one of the first ones. Uh, out there, you know, making it a place to shoot. And now it seems like, the, you know, it shares as much production um, as, 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 as Hollywood here in Los Angeles. Dustin was such a nice guy. Uh, recently I talked to Stephen Williams, probably one of the funnest guys I ever talked to. I mean, this is a weird question <laughs> I got to ask because you were on the show and it was like really hot. I think that was the third, fourth season. Um, were, what was it like? Because at the time, Johnny Depp was on the cover of I don't know, every teen magazine in the universe where you're kind of like, ooh, right. I'm here with Johnny Depp. Were you kind of excited in a way, or was it just like just a regular acting gig for you? You know, I, I didn't have any scenes with him at all. So I I got to meet him because he was on the set one day, and we just went to go and visit Dustin when he was working. And, um, and, um, and I did meet him and Jennifer Grey. That was a very, very short-lived, uh, relationship that they had, but he and Jennifer Grey were dating at the time, and she was on set as well. So yeah, that was you know Dustin and I and um, and Russell Wong. We we got really close on that one episode. We got along so well because there were not a lot of Asian actors. You know, back then it was what the early nineties, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, eighty nine, um, I believe. It was it was still very, very limited, and there were only a handful of us Asian actors that were working at all. You know, Dustin was the only regular on, on television. That was huge. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you know, to be able to, to work with him and, and, and another Asian actor, you know, we, we all bonded, I think, just from from, you know, the, the fact that there were so little of us up there, you know, 
doing actual work. You know, I got to mention another TV show. <clears throat> I don't even consider it a guilty pleasure anymore because I think it was one of the greatest shows ever. Uh, you got to do an episode of Melrose Place. <laughs> I love. Some yeah, Melrose I think I got to place. do a couple of them. I I don't remember. I think it was. I think it, it might have been a two parter. I don't remember exactly. But yeah, no, Melrose Place was huge. I I was really lucky. Now that I come to think of it, in my in my early career, um, you know, I didn't land a regular gig until I was well into my tenth year, I think, of living in Los Angeles. But but I survived quite well of doing you know guest starring roles and bit parts in movies and, and, and things like that. I, I, I didn't really, I didn't really have a regular gig until Sunset Beach. But, uh, but I did, I was lucky enough to be able to, to make a great living off of a lot of huge hit shows. I mean, just doing like guest starring roles. And, um, and it was always so fun to be able to jump from show to show and, and be able to play all these different roles. And oftentimes, um, I had great agents who did not try to pigeonhole me. They sent me out on everything that was meant for any all-American girl. So I wasn't just going up for roles that were specifically Asian because I would never have been able to survive. Um, and Noah's Place was one of the few, was one of the first that, um, that I did where... They were just looking for an all-American girl to play this model, and um, and I was able to get the role, which was awesome. The same year you got to do uh, in in uh, doing what Melrose Place. I just rewatched all of them again about a year or two ago, just because I wanted to. Wow! Uh, before uh, <laughs> before I interviewed the cast of Renegade individually, I saw you on a Renegade too. Yes. So, here's something interesting. Um, exactly 10 years before, Lorenzo Lamas was the host of the Miss Teen USA pageant that I won. That night that I was shooting that episode of Renegade, or one of the nights that we, I was shooting the episode of Renegade, the Miss Teen USA pageant was airing on television that same night. And, and we both realized at the same time that we had met exactly 10 years ago. It was amazing. He was, he's a very nice guy. He was nice. Kathleen was nice. Oh, of course, Branscombe. I mean, they, it, that had to be mm -hmm. a great set to be a part of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, they, they were amazing. And I, I, I uh, worked with Lorenzo again recently when we did the, um, uh, uh, what was that, uh, that athletic competition, what is it called? The Holly, the... Was it the Network Stars thing? Yes, not, yes, Battle of the Network Stars. That's what it was called. Battle of the Network Stars. So he, Melinda and I were on the same team. And, um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun, crazy, exhausting day. <laughs> <laughs> then you said you had that big run on Sunset Beach with the, the lovely, I know she was only in, I think, about 20 episodes. Uh, the lovely Sandra D. Robinson, uh, another woman I've got to speak to. Uh, since it beat, that was your first big, long network show, correct? Yeah, and it wasn't actually that long. I mean, I was only on it for about six months. Um, and I left that show and went directly to uh, my next gig on Nash Bridges. And so, so but yeah, that, that first regular role... Uh, didn't really happen for me until about 10 years into my career. So I had been pounding the pavement, you know, just having fun, doing a lot of modeling, commercial. I survived mostly on commercial. I was really a commercial queen back then. I had all kinds of, um, uh, you know, regular commercial gigs. I was a Philadelphia cream cheese girl in Italy. <laughs> I, I had commercials running there for seven years. They didn't even pay me for all seven years, those Italians. Oh, but, so um, but uh, yeah, they ran the commercials without paying me. But, um, but yeah, for seven years, I was a silly cream cheese girl there. And I had, um, you know, a series of commercials for Ross and Ivory Soap and Vida Sassoon. So I had a really fun early career here in Los Angeles. 
I won't lie to you. I only saw two episodes of Nash Bridges, and those were the two that Stone Cold Steve Austin was on. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I think it was during my season. I was only on for one season, yes. season three, and, and a little bit of season four. Yep. No, you were but, in it the um, ones he was in. Yeah, yeah. And so I actually ended up uh, going from that show. That was a Carlton Hughes show. You know, Carlton Hughes from Lost. Mm -hmm. He produced Lost. So he produced um, Nash Bridges. And during the hiatus, he had produced another TV show with a, a guy named Stanley Tong from Hong Kong, who had just finished shooting Rumble in the Bronx with Great Jackie movie. Chan. Love that movie. And, um, and uh, they came up with a TV show that was sort of, you know, that was, was with Sammo Hung, who was Jackie Chan's big brother growing up in Hong Kong. I never missed um, an episode of Martial Law. Oh, really? I never. Well, Sammo it was super hero fun, super hokey. It was such a fun show to be on. But at the time, when they first shot Martial Law, uh, I, I actually was uh, under contract with Nash Bridges. And, um, and Carlton phoned me up one day and he said, Hey, I've got this great role for you. I'd love for you to be a guest star in this pilot that we're shooting called Martial Law. And he, you know, explained the whole thing. I was like, say no more. I'm in. Um, and when they ended up testing the show, um, my character actually had done so well. They decided to just move me um, over from from Nash Bridges into martial law as a regular, where you know I'd have a bit more visibility and I could be more of an active, you know, because it, Nash Bridges was really about uh, Don Johnson and Cheech Marin, um, and I didn't come until season three, but uh, but on martial law I was actually only meant to be a guest star. But um, after after the pilot, they they decided to keep me on as a regular. I I love Sam Hung. I I watched his movies when I was a kid. I thought he was so funny, and I could never get over. I mean, how big he is, and how he can just and move so gracefully. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, then again, the guy grew up doing martial arts with Jackie Chan. I mean, that's all they did as kids. They went to, was it the, the opera, taking opera school? Opera school, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, when they would tell me about the things that they were forced to do as kids in training, it was, you know, borderline torture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they better be good. <laughs> oh, I remember. I was. Uh, I don't uh, think those kind of things would be allowed this day and age. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I, I remember when... Uh, he his fights with Richard Norton in some of those old Lucky Stars movies they did were just because he Richard Norton you know I mean he's another legend and and Samo's just he's doing cartwheels he's doing flips it's like wow I, I yeah do and those were all him yeah and it was amazing I've seen it was Samo like, cartwheel off of the, of the roof of a car before he's he's unbelievable you know he was just in Ip Man oh I think I can't remember if it was two or three. Oh my God! He hasn't missed missed a beat. He was right there with Donnie Yen. Oh really? Wow, wow! No, those guys are all amazing. The real deal. I mean, I have so much admiration for these guys. They really are the real deal. You know, I mean, they Samo had to have stunt people um, doing certain stunts only because insurance uh, insurance wouldn't allow him to do uh, some of the more dangerous stuff. Um, because you know, it, should anything happen to him, there was there'd be no show. Yeah. But um, but he was, you know, he was super daring. Um, even Stanley Tong, who was the director and one of the creators of the show, he was also a stuntman in Hong Kong growing up. And so he would literally, when he would direct um, shows, he would literally test the stunts for the stunt guys to make sure it was okay for them to do. <laughs> now, you do martial arts as well, don't you? Yeah, just before uh, Nash Bridges, I had been studying uh, karate. I did. Um, I I wasn't. I was only about a brown belt, I think, when when I got uh, by the time martial law came about, and then got my black belt right afterwards. But um, yeah, it was it was something that I had just taken up as a hobby, never intending to use it in my work. 
uh, it was just something that I always wanted to do growing up because I had a brother who took Kung Fu when we were kids. I would get sent to ballet class in the morning and he got to go to Kung Fu. And I wanted to learn martial arts as well, but my mom's like, no, that's, you know, back then, they're like, that's for girls. I mean, that's for boys. You know, you're a girl. You have to take ballet. Dance. And I'm glad that she made me do it because, you know, ballet is a, a good basis, you know, for base for everything, right? It's, oh, yeah. It's, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's good even for martial arts. Um, but uh, many, many years later... I was well into my 20s when um, I had a roommate who had moved in, and she, right shortly after she moved in, she asked me to come to her black belt ceremony. And, um, and I went to watch her ceremony, and I remember breaking down in tears. I was so moved by what was going on. Um, just the tradition, the grace. I thought it was just beautiful and powerful, and, um, and I literally started to cry. And I just thought, I have to do this. This is something that's been, you know, calling to me, and this must be the time. So in, within a few days that week, I, I enrolled myself in classes, and, and then shortly after that, I got on to uh, Nash Bridges. And I had to move to San Francisco. <laughs> but, um, but as soon as I came back to do martial law, I was back in class, and I got my black belt then. You know, your first movie, uh, which I just watched last week because it was Friday the 13th, and so you don't think I'm lying, I can send you a picture. In my office is a big frame poster of Friday the 13th Part 8 because I, I, loved, I loved when Jason went to Canada, I, even though they say it's Manhattan. There's no way oh, gonna, yeah. no one could be fooled to thinking that was Manhattan. But right? I love that film. I thought that film was so good. What was What's it like being an actress in a Friday the 13th film? You know, that was my very first movie. I had never done any other movie before that. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, before that I had only done, like, guest starring roles on television and stuff like that. But it wasn't... You know, being Doing film and doing TV are two completely different animals. So I went to Vancouver to shoot, thinking that I was only going to be shooting for three days. I had no idea that I was only, I was going to be up there for eight weeks because it took that long when to you're make shooting that television. Film? Yeah, they kept wow. me up there the entire time for eight weeks, um, and it was great because you know back then you could get you know like a hundred dollars a day per diem and oh, and shit. um and basically being up there for a week paid for my rent plus. I mean, you know, <laughs> just up per diem, not even you know considering what I was getting paid paid. And so I was like, I love this movie stuff. Um, and so I spent a lot of time just waiting around on set, you know, exploring the city. And so my parents and my brother actually came up to see me and, and visit with me because they thought this might be their only opportunity to ever get to see a movie set. And uh, they, didn't, they had no idea that I was going to be lasting this long in the business. They thought this was going to be, you know, like maybe a one-off. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I was never a fan of horror films, um, and still, I, I, I don't enjoy watching them. I can't stand the, the gore, and, and I get really freaked out. I mean, you know, Silence of the Lambs took me, I think, three decades to finally get over. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, being on set and watching how they do all of the, the, um, the, the special effects, and, and the costuming and, 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 you know, the different thing you know, the blood and, and, and all of that. It, it made me much more comfortable to be able to watch a horror film now because as soon as it starts getting scary, I can turn my brain to go, okay, how did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> I go, okay, so, so let's just, like, focus on the special effects. <laughs> oh, no, this is a Jason house. My son has Kane Hodder's autograph mask. We have a big oh, life-size Jason you know, in the garage. No, we're Jason people here. Oh, that's so funny. You know, Kane, his his name is actually pronounced Kane. His, I guess his dad had Hawaiian ties, and that's how he got the name Kane, K-A-N-E. It's, um, But he said it's actually... Uh, the name Kane. Well, he should have. Isn't that funny? He should have said that. I talked to him uh, last week for Friday the Thirteenth. Actually, very nice guy. Oh, amazing! Super, super nice guy. 
I get to do I get to do um, like these horror conventions every once in a great while, and and um, and I saw him I think at the last one that I was that I was doing I think he was in, Jer- in New Jersey or something. But yeah, super super sweet guy. You, you worked with Don Johnson in the beginning too. You had that uh, part in Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. You know, I never actually got to work directly with him. Uh, because he wasn't in the, the scene that I was in. Um, but uh, I was in the scene with uh, Mickey Rourke. Was it Mickey Rourke? Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I never got to actually meet Don until uh, I auditioned for, for Nash Bridges. I don't think he even remembered that I was in the film. It was such a small role. <laughs> he would never have remembered me. <laughs> how, how, was, how was Mickey Rourke? You hear mixed things about him. You know, I, I heard things about him as well, but he could not have been nicer. Good. You know, there were only, I think, two of us that were extras that day. And um, and instead of going back to his room in between, you know, it was me and this, and this other young guy, this young actor. Um, instead of going back to his room in between takes and stuff, he actually sat with us, the actors, um, not with the directors and producers and whatnot in Video Village or back in his trailer, he hung out with us on set and just talked shop the whole time. He was so amazing and open, and I think he just really loved young actors, you know. Um, Later on, many, many years later, I had uh, lunch with him. Uh, Another friend of mine had, had invited me to lunch. And I found out that he actually always wanted to be an acting teacher. Hmm. And so, yeah, um, he, that was his dream was to, was to, to be an acting coach. And, um, and I guess, you know, it made sense now, you know, after I heard that, that, you know, he hung out with us and just loved talking, you know, about acting and technique and classes and all of that stuff. So yeah, he was great, really great to work with. Now, here's a question you probably get sick of, but in 2002, you were in the uh, the most electrifying man in sports entertainment's first film, uh, The Scorpion King. I'm talking about The mm. Rock. Right. Did you think, and, and I, I love The Rock. I, I, I love The Rock. I mean, he's one of my favorite actors. I liked him when, I, when I used to watch wrestling. <laughs> Did you ever think uh-huh. back then that the guy who was a, a, the people's champ, you know, a wrestler, would go mm-hmm. on 10, 12 years later to become the highest paid actor in Hollywood? You know what? I did. I knew it. Because when we were shooting in 2002, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Van Damme, all those guys were done. Yeah. They had their days. And there was nobody that fit that action hero mold better than Dwayne. There was a, a big hole in the industry. And, um, and, and I saw how people reacted toward him. Everybody loved him. Men, women, boys, girls, grandmas, grandpas. I mean, he has, he appeals to Every person and at every age, any just genre, um, and he was really smart. And he didn't take himself too seriously on set, but he was smart. Um, so he had that 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 charisma that everyone was attracted to him. He was tough and funny and smart. I mean, he had everything it took. And I I think I might have even told him on set one day. I said, "You're going to be the next action hero." You're you're the next big thing in Hollywood. I, it was it was so obvious to me because there was that 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 hole in the industry that was left waiting for somebody like him to come in and fill it. Oh, he's amazing. He's one guy that I'll be like, oh, new rock movie's coming out. Got to go see the new rock movie. You don't even care what the plot is. It's mm-hmm. like got to go see the movie that the rock's no. in. Yeah, his charisma is unbelievable. You know, I mean. Even when he was a wrestler, people just loved seeing him. He was so smart and so funny. Um, I think that, um, and also, you know, being of like mixed race, I think ev- he can appeal to everyone, right? He's he's sort of that everybody wants to be his friend. Everybody wants to, to know who this guy is and, and be in his world. You know, when, when we went backstage to a wrestling show years ago, 
um, and he was on it. You know, I mean, he was nice to us. He signed my my program. You know, he was cool. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, but it's it's scary mm-hmm. because like I'm looking at this guy and he's so big. And flash forward twenty yeah. years later, and he's like, I don't know, a hundred pounds bigger. It's like frightening. Oh. <laughs> I think, um, yeah. While he was shooting, you know, he was he was off of of wrestling for a little while, and I think shortly after we finished shooting, before the or after the movie came out, he had gone back into wrestling, and I had never watched anything in wrestling before. I mean, maybe I saw a little bit on TV when my grandfather used to watch many years before, you know, Rock ever got into wrestling. Um, and it was just never my thing. But I remember going to uh, one of the wrestling matches. He gave us, like, 50 of us. Uh, he had his own little section, and um, it was all the people from the film, um, you know, makeup artists and, and, and stunt guys and all these guys that were working on the film. And um, I remember being in that audience and seeing all the people with all their signs and, like, cheering. I mean, it was, you know, like, you know where the word fan comes from, you know, that fanatical sort of very uh, just crazy, crazy fandom. And and I was amazed to see how, how fun it was to be at one of those shows. I started screaming and yelling so much that I literally had to leave early because I had launched myself into an asthma attack, laughing and screaming so hard. It was awesome. It was awesome. If I, if I didn't say that when I was in my 20s, I walked around talking in the third person like him for a few weeks, I'd be a dirty liar. <laughs> I think everyone did. Everyone did. You had, even when he played right? the bad guy, you had to love this guy. I mean, it was just something. I loved his Baywatch movie. How many people say that? You know, come on. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, this guy can do no wrong. He's amazing. Even when he does a bad film, it's great. <laughs> it is. It's, you know, and then you also, the we, we mentioned him uh, earlier, you did Cradle to the Grave with... Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and the big deal about that, I remember I thought that was funny when it came out because, like, on normal TV, it was... Jet Li, DMX. But if you watch the commercial on MTV, it was DMX, Jet Li. But for me, I was super <laughs> excited because Mark Dacascos was the bad guy. And I had seen, oh, you know, yeah. like he had already done, you know, Crying Free Man, which never got a release here. Drive, you know, he'd done so many cool movies. I always mm-hmm. thought he he was the, the, the big martial arts, you know, the big breakout martial arts guy that I thought I would see in like, you know, two or three times a year excuse me, a year in the big screen, and I never did, you know, so that was really neat to see him in the theater. Um, what was that like? Mm-hmm. I mean, that had to been a fun movie to film. I mean, you had uh, Anthony Edwards, you had uh, Tom Arnold. Mm-hmm. It had to be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, we'd have a great time on set. Um, Mark was amazing to work with. You know, he, he and I have worked together a few times now, and he's, you know, Hawaii boy as well. Um, he grew up in, in, in Germany, but, um, spent some time in Hawaii as well. So I consider him a local boy, um, cause he's Hawaiian at heart as well. He's, he's just so kind and so generous and just the nicest, nicest person. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was great being able to work on that set. Cause I had a bunch of friends that, you know, uh, Ron Yuan, who's also like a brother to me. Um, I got to work with uh, on that film, and uh, and there were so many like great comedians, Anthony and and, and Tom Arnold. Um, that in between, you know, scenes and takes and stuff, um, when we were waiting around, these guys would make up songs and rap, and, and it was like it was so funny. It was, I think, I it was the most fun that I've ever had on set in between takes. Seriously, we'd play games, we'd hide, you know, like song underwear and, you know, hanging on people's backs. That was like a game that we always played, like, you know, see who you could hang the underwear on. And once, you know, the person realized that they were, they were it and they had to like try to figure out how to get close enough to somebody and, and, and pin it on somebody else. You, us actors were pretty safe though, because, you know, we couldn't get caught with that kind of stuff. Um, and ruin a shot. It was too expensive. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they, they would, they made up all kinds of games 
and, you know, waiting around on the set there. Because I remember we spent a lot of time waiting. That's, that's, you know, when you've got these big action scenes, um, these setups and stuff take a lot of time. It was, it was, um, one of the biggest budgets of, um, of, uh, action that, that I've ever seen. You know, I remember there was a, a, a scene where this, tank comes crashing through a warehouse and there's yes. all this gunfight. Oh my God. I remember there, there were, you know how, like when you have cameras, they, they're, they're, they're doing the, um, the doors or they're calling action and, and you have a camera, B camera, C camera, and everybody has to do their own click. I mean, by the time they were done, I think they were on like M camera or, or some even O camera, something like that. It was so long that it was like I think an, an two minutes of footage just to get <laughs> through all the all the cameras, all the boards. But um, but yeah, it, you know that's what it takes when you have that much invested in one stunt. You have to cover it from all angles with tons of cameras, and none of the cameras can be showing. And you know it's just um, it's it, it's it's uh, it's it's almost it's math. You know it's geometry. You have to figure out how to set everything perfectly because you have one take and that's it. You know, I was a, a big fan of that. I liked all the fighting sequences in it. You know, it was a neat, mm -hmm. you know, I liked the little sequence there where they had, uh, they brought in Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, you know, where, so Jet Li could beat up all the <laughs> UFC guys. It was just a fun movie. Uh -huh. but, you know, one movie, I got to skip ahead because there's one movie that you were in that I am a huge fan of. Um, and it doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, Stars a very, well, I shouldn't say stars. It's a very small part of a man. One day, I'm, I'm going to interview. I've been trying for a long time. Uh, very young Scott Adkins was in this film. I'm talking oh, about the he's tournament. amazing. The tournament, yeah. Such Talk about a good beautiful movie. martial arts. His martial arts is like watching a ballet. Um, and there's a fight. My, my dream fight is between Scott Adkins and... And uh, and Mark Dacascos, watching those two fight would be just like watching a ballet, right? They're 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 for I mean they're just gorgeous in their martial arts, and I think Scott said he started as a gymnast, uh, and that's why I think he has the grace that he does in his martial arts. But yeah, he was he was pretty awesome to work with, such a a, a, a pro and and. You know, just beautiful, beautiful to watch. You were even in there with your future uh, Vampire Diary star, a guy my wife has a, uh, or had a crush on, probably still does. Oh, Ian, older. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ian was awesome. <laughs> yeah, she harasses he and I actually me on a monthly basis. She, every month, she, when are you going to interview Ian Summerholder? Like, he, 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 <laughs> he doesn't return my calls, hon. I, I, I don't have him on speed <laughs> dial. So, uh, uh, I love the Everybody tournament. Everybody loves, loves Ian. No, he's, he's awesome. I think he married a Hawaiian girl, too. I, yeah. I, I watched Vampire Diaries, but I kind of watched it with my wife. I remember you were Pearl on it. Like, I remember the show, mm -hmm. but I, it was kind of like I'm watching it with my wife, you know, kind of. I'm not, I wasn't uh -huh. the target audience for the show, but I was the target audience for the tournament. That, it's such an amazing movie. And I tell anyone that'll listen to, to pick it up because it just kind of, it just kind of, kind of quietly kind of came out and, and without a mm -hmm. lot of fanfare. And it's so good. I mean, it's such a good cast in it. Uh, that movie was one of the victims of the wine scheme, you know, um, when the wine scenes were buying up films and then they would just never get a release. Um, we were supposed to have a theatrical release. It never came. But, um, you know, it was, it was really unfortunate because it was such a great film and it was so fun to do, fun to watch. And the, my favorite fight scene that I've ever done was in the tournament with Scott Atkins. That was my favorite fight scene to this day. You, you have you have to let him know I'm a I'm a good guy, and I'm pretty sure it's his manager not sending. No, I'm just joking around. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I no. have no contact with no, him, <laughs> but if I did, I would put in a good word for him. He strikes me as a guy that uh, keeps pretty busy, so I think he's got to be pretty selective. But that was one of the first things I saw him in. To be honest with you, might have been one of his very first films. To be honest, with Scott, yeah. I thought he had done another one of these action films where he had played a Russian 
with that Russian accent. Oh, yeah, he was Boyka and Undisputed, too. I might have seen the tournament yeah. first. I can't remember, but That's what he was very was. convincing with that accent. Yeah, he did a great job. But, you know, I think he's kind of shy. I don't think he's the kind of guy that does a lot of interviews or, you know, does a lot of media. Um, I, I, I think he's, he, he comes across to me as being a guy who's just, he does the work and he, you know, he does the characters, but he's very shy as a person. Now, my wife will kill me if I don't ask. You were in X-Men 2. What was mm-hmm. it like being in there with Hugh Jackman? Hugh is such a gentleman. Just the nicest guy around. Seriously, I think he, you, you, you've never heard a bad thing about him, right? He's no. Just, he can do no wrong. This guy is so sweet, so professional, such a gentleman. I mean, I, I can't, I, I, I don't know, I don't have enough white, nice words to say about him. He's just, he's perfect. <laughs> he's as perfect as you think he is. <laughs> you, you've done X Men. You've done voices for DC, Arrow, which I'm going to ask you about in a minute. Are you? Uh, I'm going to take a shot in the dark. Uh, are Are you a comic book reader by chance, or do you just get lucky and get cast in these comic book parts? Do you know I'm not. I'm not a comic comic book reader. I didn't even know who the X Men were until the, <laughs> the first movie came out. I had no idea that X Men even existed until the first movie, and then it was such a huge hit. I was like, oh, I should go see this. Um, but yeah, I was never a big comic book person. I mean, if I was, I you know, I I I, I read like you know Richie Rich and Archie and stuff like that. Yeah, I was not into like Marvel because you know, growing up in Hawaii, also we were more into like Japanese, you know, um, action action heroes like Kamen Rider and Ultraman and oh, Rainbow I love Man. Ultraman. And, yeah, it was it was a whole different sort of you know culture um and so yeah i did not grow up with all of these 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 comic books although i did have friends from hawaii who 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 were big in in this world and so anyway whenever i get an audition for for things that are comic related i i always ask my friends who are the big comic book geeks i go okay so tell me about this character what should i know and they'll just start rattling off you know, all the relationships and the history and, you know, <laughs> like, wow, I'm always amazed at the, as to how much people get into this stuff and how much knowledge they, they have about, because it's a long history now. It's decades and decades. Like, if I were to have to um, research it all myself, it, it would take me years. Um, but, uh, but, you know, thank goodness I have a lot of comic book friend geeks who, who keep me abreast. <laughs> keep me in the know. <laughs> oh, when um, when Arrow came out, I when Arrow first was announced, I I cared less because you know I wasn't a huge Green Arrow fan. But then the show was so mm-hmm. good, and then when they brought you in as, uh, when they brought you in as China White um, or uh, Shen Na Wei is is what it is in the comics. He calls her mm-hmm. China White because he can't pronounce Shen Na Wei. Mm-hmm. Um, you yeah. were so. You look like the drawing come to life. You were so good in that. I I cannot Thank put you. over how amazing you were in that. And you had a nice, and you know, you, you were in there with Michael J. White as Bronze Tiger, who was so mm-hmm. good. Uh, Stephen Emil was mm-hmm. like, so good as Arrow. I mean, that show was just mm-hmm. so amazing. And you, you were so fantastic. And I wish you could have been in every episode. <laughs> I wish too. <laughs> it would have been nice. But I had a nice long run on that. I think I had a, maybe a total of like eight episodes. Eight, no, maybe ten episodes. By the time the the show was finished, I they even brought me back in the last season. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it was always fun. And I was always thinking that I was going to go back up to, to to Vancouver and work in you know some capacity. That you know I was always working there on Arrow or on other films or you know I I have a bag at the hotel that I usually stay at. Um, packed and just I just leave a bunch of stuff there um, because I work there so often that I figured I might as well just leave it there. <laughs> stuff that I don't care, you know, that I lose, but I don't want to have to, you know, pack up and bring with me all the time. What was it like filming the episode of Arrow? Because, you know, that was very, a lot of the stunt work and fight scenes in that were very elaborate, especially in the realm of television. 
Was it pretty oh, hard? Oh, yeah. Like, pretty hard schedule there? Yeah, especially in the first season. You know, I came on in episode two, the mm-hmm. first show after the pilot. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they, they didn't quite have their system down yet. You know, they were, they were just starting. So they, they used us actors a lot in the choreography, in the rehearsal. And, um, and I remember shooting that one fight sequence in that silo, right? Where, um, where I'm using the gambit and he's using this, this staff Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the director just, we only had like maybe 30 seconds of choreography that we, that we were taught. And, um, and so he said, just keep doing it over and over and over again. <laughs> and he had us doing it over and over and over until, until I just dropped. I was so exhausted. He just ran the camera and he's like, just keep doing it until I say cut. And he never called cut. And there was a time where I just started screaming. And there was a point where I literally was trying, trying to fight for my life just to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen Steven was amazing. And he was so, you know, he's so athletic. I don't believe he had done martial arts before Arrow, but, um, but he picked up on choreography and everything very, very quickly. He's so, he's so athletic and so agile. Um, but then towards the end, of the, of the, you know, of the show, of the whole run in season eight, um, I hardly did any of the martial arts myself because they had figured out that they couldn't, uh, use their, their actors the way they were doing. <laughs> it, it, it would cause too many injuries and, you know, actors just didn't have the time to learn all that choreography. They were too busy learning, you know, dialogue and shooting and whatnot. So they had, um, uh, they, they, they figured out how to better use their stunt people for a lot of the action stuff and then just brought the actors in to do close ups and, and short little one ups. They knew then how to edit in such a way that the actors didn't have to do everything. And you could always get better fight scenes with the stunt people anyway. They're, you know, all my stunt girls are much better at martial arts even than I am. So, so there was no reason to have to, to, to exhaust or, or injure your actors. Oh, yeah. He, I remember he was, uh, I mean, he's had a couple of professional wrestling fights. He was on American Ninja Warrior. He's a, uh, and it's funny because, but when he got cast as Arrow, I remember I was like, well, he's the other male prostitute on the, on the show Hung with Thomas Jane. I was like, he's going to be, yeah. he's going to be the green arrow, you know? And then when I watched <laughs> it, it was just like, I was very sad when the show ended. I mean, that show, I mean, people can laugh at me, but, that was the first d- real DC superhero show. I mean, that was groundbreaking. That that channel is a whole DC universe now, and it's all because of that show. Yeah, yeah. And Steven fit the character so well. Now you couldn't imagine who else would have played it, right? No one. He, he did such a great job. And um, I wonder sometimes if he's going to have that sort of that Superman curse now that he's done, he's, he's so associated with Arrow and being the Green Arrow that um, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how his, his acting uh, career develops after this. Because you know how that, that Superman curse, like anybody who plays Superman can never really break out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I wonder, you know, how he's going to be able to, to, to evolve as an actor now. I wouldn't be surprised if Arrow came back. I don't know. Do you think Stephen would want to do it? I don't know. I mean, it's a comic book character that they never stay gone. You know, I, I've seen right. people get killed in comics, and fifteen years later, they're somehow back. Excuse me, back from the dead. So, uh, mm-hmm. I know the fans would sure love to see it. it. Sorry, I know the fans would sure love to see him come back. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. It depends, right? It depends on, on the writing. It depends on, you know, everything has to be so perfect, right? Um, sometimes it's it's better just to let things die as they are. Oh, yeah. But I think in this case, I think that, um, that uh, you know, who knows? It, it could... You look at how many Ninja, Ninja Turtle uh, series have been done. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they just keep recycling. I mean, 
they just and, and in fact the the Ninja Turtles that I was on wasn't even finished shooting. We weren't even done with our series before Nickelodeon announced a new Ninja Turtles cast and a new Ninja Turtles series. So yeah. they just they even overlap. I mean, it's so yeah. I, as long as there's a demand, as long as people want to see it, I guess um, you know Hollywood will make their money on it. See, we it were, always comes down to the money. The right? turtles you were in was the one we were. I was digging as much as my son was. The turtles you were in, where you were Shredder's daughter and all that, and then you, yeah, and then they they change. It's like now the turtles are going into outer space. It's like, it was like, well, this got <laughs> stupid real fast, and then you know, but but then again, in in you know, turtle. I read the Ninja Turtle comics before they were when they were black and white comics before that dumb cartoon in the eighties came out. There's not a doubt uh-huh. in my mind within another five or ten years there'll be another incarnation of it and another ten mm-hmm. years after that. I mean, it, it'll keep going. I don't even think it'll take that long. <laughs> no, I mean, because there's clearly a lot of money in that franchise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's it's gone on for generations and generations. I mean, there are Ninja Turtle fans, as many Ninja Turtle fans now as there were in the first you know, when the first comic books came out. So, yeah, that, that thing is never going to die. Now, you said you didn't like horror, yet you had a nice big run on the Vampire Diaries. Or would you consider that more a love story? A little of both. I mean, that was really... Uh, that had some really good writing in it as well. I remember... Um, you know, I remember when, when, when uh, there were rumors about this first coming out. And I was working on another movie in uh, in New York, and um, and you know we were on set, and and uh, one of our one of the the actors, his his friend was um, was Wes, who got cast in that, and um, as, as one of the leads, and and he was telling us about it, and all three of us actors at the same time said, "I want to be a vampire." <laughs> And then, like, three weeks later, I get cast on this Vampire Diary. I was like, wow, talk about manifestation. That was amazing. Um, but, yeah, it, it, you know, it was such, it's such a fun genre, you know, that, that I, I mean, I guess it's considered horror, but I, I hardly consider vampire genre as horror because I feel like it's a whole other thing. It has, I feel like there's more character development especially in, in the Vampire Diaries, there was a great storyline, um, a really cool, fun history to it. Um, and I feel like uh, it has, it just has a, a, a wider reach than your average horror film. Um, and um, yeah, there, there was just a lot of really great characters. And, and, um, and uh, it was I, I, I know so many people who had, who got really hooked on that show. My wife. It was really, really well written. Yeah, I, I wasn't the target audience for it. Um, my wife wanted to go to one of those, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the company that put it on, and you get to meet the actors, and you go through a tour of where mm-hmm. they film, and... And it, it was, it was <laughs> oh my God, we went to a, a, a two week vacation in Florida cheaper than we would have gone to this, uh, this convention, you know, and it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I mean, vampires are, I mean, even if you go back to the Dracula, they're sexualized characters, you know, but I'm a, I'm more old school. I'm a Fright Night, Lost Boys, Buffy the Vampire mm. Slayer. I wasn't the target audience for Vampire Diaries, but I, I, no, I, I liked more about it in the beginning. And, yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was great. I mean, I think um, I guess it was more female driven, but they had beautiful, beautiful people. Vampires are always so good looking, right? Um, but, but they, but you know, beyond that, I think it was it was kind of nine hundred two one wish. Now yeah. that I think about it, yeah. I just realized it was sort of like nine hundred two one zero with vampires. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> sent me a poster. It's still hanging up in my basement of a. Uh, of uh, Wesley Snipes' Blade getting ready to kill uh, Ian Summerhalder, <laughs> which uh, I've always really enjoyed. Yeah. So, uh, now, I, that was a great movie. Oh, I love Blade. I, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I would have loved to have been in one of those. That was, that was like, the, I think, my first 
like sexy vampire film that I just was like I was in awe of it. it, it you know, Wesley was amazing. He was he uh, another uh, fantastic martial artist. Um, I don't know what happened to him, what he's been doing lately, but he was the guy. I remember when that movie came out. Fright Night is still the greatest vampire film ever made. You think? <laughs> oh, hands down. I never, I, you know, I saw, oh God, I'm old. I don't know how little I was when I saw it. I, I make it, I watch it at least two or three times a year to this, you know, 40 something years later. I love that film. I think it's the best vampire movie ever. Best story. Best I don't think everything. I ever saw it. <gasps> I don't, yeah, I don't think I ever saw it. Like I said, I'm not a big horror fan. This so place, unless I have to do research or something, that's not my first go-to. If you have Amazon Prime, it is on there. You need to watch it. Who is, doesn't have Amazon Prime? It's so original. <laughs> it's, this kid has a vampire living next door to him, and of course no one believes him. So he hires huh. an old horror movie host to help him kill this vampire. Uh, Chris Sarandon, <laughs> Roddy McDowell. I mean, it's, it's such oh, a good cast. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it, you might get freaked out at a few parts, but... I mean, it is, oh, I, I can't praise how amazing it is. Do you remember that show Dark Shadows? Oh, yes. The old vampire soap opera. Did you know, <laughs> yes. Did you know that, that I had done uh, a, a role in one of the remakes that they tried to do? They did a pilot of Dark Shadows, and um, it never got picked up, um, but, uh, but yeah, the they, they tried to, to redo that, like, uh, I guess back in the 90s, I guess it was. No, maybe it was later, 2000. Um, it, um, it never got picked up, but it was it was uh, a really fun um, idea to be able to, to bring that back and sort of modernize it. They might have even tried to do it again after we did our TV pilot, but I think it's one of those that they keep trying to bring back because I think it has potential. Um, they just need to get the right, uh, you know, actors and writers and, and producers involved. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think this whole vampire world is, just, you know, the love uh, and, and attraction to vampires and werewolves, I don't think that'll ever die. I think people are always going to like that. I have yet to see, I've only seen a couple good werewolf movies. I'm more of a vampire guy than a werewolf guy. Vampire Diaries had a werewolf in vampires it Vampires are just I mean. sexier. They are, yeah. and, and they Not use that power to get the ladies, too. They hypnotize them with their eyes. <laughs> you know, that's uh, Dracula knew what he was doing. Right? Exactly. I mean, you can go back to you know, back when George Hamilton was Love at First Bite. You know, he had the cape. You know, that's how he got the women, so. Oh, my God. I forgot about that. Not that George Hamilton needed to be a vampire to get women. I mean, come on. That guy was the it guy. The only weird thing is, like, that is the tannest vampire I've ever seen in my life. I have to say that. Yeah. But I know. I just showed that movie to my son not that long ago. I mean, the movie's still funny yeah. all these years later. Yeah, he was great. He was great. He's, you know, he was actually a really good actor. I think his, his persona sort of overshadowed his acting. Um, but, yeah, he was, you know, to, doing comedy is not easy. Yeah, to me, it's the hardest genre to to, to be able to to do and uh, to do well, and he did it well. A lot of people say it's the hardest to do. Yeah, it takes a a certain amount of timing, and um, and uh, it's 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 very difficult because it's so precise. You know the 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 timing of it, the line reading, the 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 facial expressions, everything has to be perfect in order for it to hit right. And, um, and it's, you know, it's not just about the writing. You know, you've got, like, broad comedy, and sometimes that works, but I think audiences nowadays especially are much smarter than that. And, um, and so, yeah, it, doing comedy really well is, is truly an art, true, true talent. And there are so many actors that you don't realize that are, great comedians because you only see them doing their action or their drama series or, or, you know, you see them, they're known for different roles. But, um, but yeah, comedy to me is, is the hardest thing to do. And I love when you see like, um, great comedians, uh, turn that off 
and 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 do you know great dramatic roles it just it's even that much more amazing right to watch somebody who you know as a comedian like really hit uh, an amazing dramatic role because you 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 want to laugh you want them to be funny but then they are able to touch that other part of you that just makes you crumble it's it's it, I love when that happens. I think Jim Carrey is one of the greatest dramatic actors out there, but sadly, people that's like exactly people want to see. Yeah, him that's act like exactly goof. what I was thinking of. He's so yeah. Good. The Majestic is such an amazing film for people that haven't seen it, but people would rather see him act mm-hmm. really stupid, which he's really good at being a, a goofy comedian. But he is an amazing uh-huh. actor. Right. I mean, what are those people who who people don't realize is funny is John Hamm. You know, I think a lot of people think of him as that guy from, um, what is that series, uh, Mad Men, right? Mm-hmm. But actually, he's very funny. And then, um, and, and Christian Bale is actually very funny, too, I think. He's, I mean, there's a lot of these guys, it, it, they're, they're known for certain roles, but you don't realize, like, how, how funny they can be, the comedy. Um, but, you know, that's the fun of acting, right? You get to stretch in all these different ways. You were on a show that, I mean, I watched it. It's considered a comedy, although I didn't know if I was supposed to laugh. Um, you had a couple episodes of <laughs> Diet Land with Joy Nash. Yeah, that was a really weird show. Thank you. I didn't want I, to be the one to say it. It is a we- It was a weird-ass show is exactly what it was. It was so weird. And you're right about the, you know, people not knowing if they were supposed to laugh. Because it wasn't, like, funny laugh out loud. It was just weird. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it probably didn't do well. um, Because I think its audience was so specific. Um, And, yeah, even I didn't quite get get it all the time. Um, I think you had to be, like, a, a woman in her... 40s living in New York to be able to get it. <laughs> I, I know it. Well, you know they left it where it was going to come back, but it's it's been a couple of years. I, I don't think it's coming back. Yeah, yeah. I I, I don't I don't know. I, who knows? I, I but yeah, that was I didn't fun. Get it. I didn't get it. I, I didn't understand it. I mean, like it wasn't like I was too stupid to understand it. I just, I didn't get what they were going for. It was just weird to me. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe, like I said, I think you, you had to be of a specific, you had to be a, a, a specific kind of person to be able to understand where that comedy was coming from. Um, but it was all, I think it was all women who ran that show. Mm-hmm. I think it was all women in the room, yeah, uh, female writers, directors, producers. So yeah, that was that was great in that sense, that, you know, that, that it was all run by women, but I think that it got a little bit too specific. Now I've already taken up about an hour of your time, so I I, I want to kind of hasn't been already. It has, yeah. I it, it's gone. Wow. Back what do you have? Yes. Com- what do you have coming up on the horizon for for all your fans? Well, um, you know about this animation project that I've done. Oh, um, I love my DC animated. Batman. Oh yeah. <laughs> I got to work again with Mark Costcos. Funny enough, though, you know, when when I voice uh, a lot of this animation stuff, I never actually get to be in the room with the other actors, especially now during COVID. Um, you know, I haven't been doing a lot of on-camera stuff at all. Uh, no one has, really. But, um, you know, they've just started production up again. But, uh, you know, I, I have been able to work out of my home studio and been doing a lot of animation, so... I've got another video game coming out, another animation film, but all of this stuff is always top secret. You can never tell anybody about it. Uh. So, <laughs> um, but I do have a film that um, that I did last year in October in Hawaii um, that was supposed to be released this summer on Netflix called Finding Ohana. With and, uh, um, I don't know if, Yes, with Branscombe, exactly. So, so you'll know uh, when I know <laughs> about when the actual release is supposed to happen. Um, but, but look for that because it's a really fun um, family film uh, that stars um, a, a girl, a young girl from Hawaii. It's her very first role. 
and um, and Polynesian actors, a lot of firsts actually. We have a lot of uh, first uh, first time actors. Uh, Lin- Lindsay Watson, who comes from uh, Maui, who went to Kamehameha, you know, my alma mater. Um, Alex Iono and um, and Kea uh, Peahi, uh, whose grandmother apparently I went to school with. <laughs> <laughs> I play her mom, but I, 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 you know, I actually went to school with her grandmother. Um, uh, but it's a all local, you know, not local, uh, all Hawaiian cast, Polynesian cast, I should say, because Alex isn't actually Hawaiian, but he is Maori and Samoan. Um, and um, and it's sort of, uh, it's all shot in Hawaii. Well, no, I take that back again. Uh, it's shot partly in Hawaii, some of it in Thailand and New York. Um, but it's like the Goonies, and it's a, a, a fun adventure film um, with a lot, of Hawaiian legend and lore, and um, I was so proud to be a part of this 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 project. Um, they had so much respect for Hawaii and the way that they were shooting it, and the input that they they wanted. They wanted to make sure that they were very respectful of the culture and um, and the language. I actually got to do dialogue in Hawaiian with Grand Scum, which was amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, it. it definitely something to look out for so i don't know when the release will be and how they're going to be doing it but um but look out for finding ohana on netflix i have a, a, a some cases of ohana punch in my refrigerator so I'll, I'll save those for when i get to see the film i have some uh, uh aloha ice seagram's <laughs> wine coolers <laughs> <laughs> yours probably tastes better than mine <laughs> Yeah, they're not too bad. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, <laughs> they're kind of like 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 punch. <laughs> yeah, I, I the, the Ohana punch or the Ohana drink is not that great. You know, I, I forgot to mention too. You were also in the movie Maximum Impact with Mark Dacascos again. Oh, yes. You and Mark Dacascos yes, are shot connected. Shot that in Russia. Sorry. You and Mark Dacascos are connected all these years. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's like a brother to me. He he and I are so close now. I love him. He and his wife Julie are are such good people, and uh, I love working with him. I mean, we get paired up a lot for some reason, but uh, never enough. Never enough. I love that guy. I, I really <laughs> liked how in the third John Wick, where Keanu Reeves has kind of the longer, scruffier hair, so Dacascus uh-huh. shaved his head to have him wear that Shaolin monk look. I thought that was really good yeah. cool contrast. I really liked that. I don't know whose idea that was, but it was genius. Yeah, right? You know that Mark actually wanted to be a monk? At one point in his life, he wanted, he thought he was going to be a monk. So, yeah, I'm sure he was happy to shave his head. <laughs> I don't think I could ever be a monk. They're like, training it like, well, like the Shaolin monks, and that'd be kind of cool, but... I like the ladies. I don't think I could be a monk. But, uh, <laughs> no, I. Uh, you know, I. Uh, that's probably what kept Mark from being an actual monk as well. <laughs> it, you know, I think that's what keeps that would keep a lot of people. So, uh, you know, so, you know, I mean, it's amazing. You, 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 you've done the whole gambit. I mean, television, movies, voice work. You're able to I go have- back and forth. It's it's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I have been so fortunate. I always say I have such, I've had such a fun career so far. I get to play all the most fun characters. Um, I've had some really iconic roles and action and comic book world, and I get to do all these comic cons now. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've had a, a, the most fun anyone could have in, in an acting career, seriously. When you, I'm so thankful. When you do the Comic Cons, what do people recognize you most from? Um, I get a lot of uh, of of Lady Death Strike, you know, from X Two, and uh, and of course China White from Arrow. Um, but a little bit of everything, you know. I even a lot of video games and stuff that I've done characters for, like Mortal Kombat, and um, you know, I just. Um, it's, it's it's my whole world, and it's so funny. I, I, I'm not one to sit down and read a comic book, but uh, but that seems to be the world that I exist in best. <laughs> I'm sure people recognize you from the Scorpion King. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get asked about that a lot, too. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've, had, I've had so much fun over the years. I'm, I, it's not over yet. I'm sure, 
you know, I'll be doing a lot more of this kind of stuff, especially in voiceover. It's, I, I've been able to, to do a nice transition into voiceover, which has been such a blessing during COVID. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm super, super lucky to, to have had the, the opportunities that I've had. Does anybody ever recognize you from the doors? No. I no hated, one. I hated that movie. I'm going to go on record and say, I watched that movie and I didn't like it. So then everybody says, no, you got to be as no, fucked no. up as humanly possible to like it. So I got high as a really? kite and watched it. And I liked it even less. <laughs> really? Yeah, I am the one but, guy that disliked that film. Sal Humor was amazing. Oh, he, he the, and the fact that he looked exactly like him was creepy, and the fact he looked just like uh, John Holmes in Wonderland was even creepier yet. I mean that. Uh, I mean, you know, Val <laughs> is one of I think the most underrated actors. Oh, he's a great Batman. actor. I just couldn't get into the movie. He is. Yeah, but he he has such amazing ability to he's a chameleon to be able to, to morph into his characters um i would love to see him work more i don't know why he doesn't but he is such an amazing amazing actor he was a really, really nice guy he was sick wasn't he didn't he have throat cancer Oh, did he? There was something wrong I with him. That. I heard he was sick. He always had a scarf wrapped around oh, his no. throat. He might be okay now. I don't. I remember there was always con uh, reports like, no, he doesn't have it. Yes, he has it. But I mean, you could clearly tell by listening to him that something wasn't right. Oh, I had no idea. I just oh, watched, that's so unfortunate. I just watched him in Top Secret yesterday, actually. Wasn't he great? He was. My, my, <laughs> my son was like, I want to see something funny. I was like, I got just the movie uh -huh. for you, son. You know, And he ended up liking uh -huh. it. So, Yeah, and Real Genius. Remember real that genius one? Real Genius is good. He was a good Batman. Yeah. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Oh, my yeah, God. I mean, he. my favorite Batman is Adam West. I, I'll make no shame in saying that. Uh, but the only other Batman movie that I've liked was the Val Kilmer one. Yeah, no, Val is great. Super un underrated actor. Um, yeah, it, I, I wish we would see more of him. Yeah, I just, I, I think the reason I didn't like the Doors movie is because I really didn't like the band. Oh! And I think had I liked the music, maybe I would have liked it more. I just remember going, really? this movie, yeah, I remember I was they just... Were like, Oh, they were so good. They were really, I mean, <laughs> they, I guess the Beatles, you would say, is like the, the voice of that generation, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, but, but they were, they were right up there. Val was, he was, you know, he was such a character, definitely somebody, you know, who had an interesting life, enough to make a movie about, but, um, but uh, but yeah, that was that was such a great film. I I I don't think you have to be a fan of The Doors in in order to to appreciate the film. I, I was, um, I'm saying I, think I watched it was just great work. I watched it straight and I watched it high. Neither one did <laughs> neither one did anything uh, for me. But that's uh, too bad. That's I'm more bad. of a Ramones, Dead Kennedys, Black Flag kind of guy. So uh, oh yeah, I I, I even think darker. That, I, you know, I did. Now I find myself listening to like really quiet, mellow music. I think once you have a kid, you you want the quiet. That's why when he watched the uh, Max and Ruby you cartoon, got, you gotta I have loved stuff it. that calms your nerves. Yes, that's why you, you always had to find those children's cartoons that were very quiet. You know, where the characters made you listen. It was like, oh, I love this. Do they exist? Yeah, Max and Ruby, the two rabbits. Like they were so quiet, you had to pay attention and watch. So the house oh. was always quiet when that was on. You got to get into Phineas and Ferb, though. That's one of the ones that a lot of adults say that they are able to watch with their kids. Are we tr that's the one with the ducks in it, right? The, it's a platypus. Platypus. Okay, I know I showed it to him. I know we watched a few, but he kind of was like a huge SpongeBob junkie. Oh, okay. But then all okay. at once, it just changed. He he wanted to start watching Power Rangers, Godzilla. Then it morphed into. Uh. Uh, Bruce Lee movies when he started doing martial arts when he was young. Then he wanted to do horror movies. Oh, so he was a rough kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, get that. 
my my basement is you know it was adorned i had friday the 13th snow globes and statues so he was always just oh. so fascinated by it he just started watching horror at a at a younger age and you know honestly some of those 80s horror movies they're, they're pretty damn corny so yeah you know he thought godzilla nobody, was nobody watched those like thinking that they were actually going to be scared right i mean i i think people watch that for for the corniness so that they could sort of laugh and be scared at the same time i remember when he thought godzilla was rex from toy story and i was kind of leery of letting him watch him because <laughs> he was like four and my friend was like, well, does he watch Power Rangers? And I'm like, well, yeah. And she was like, don't you remember those old Godzilla movies? It was a guy in a suit. They're so stupid. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I forgot about that. So then, you know, at uh -huh. age four, he was already hooked on, like, Godzilla movie. He has a bunch of Godzilla stuff in his room still. Yeah, no, it's, I guess there's there's that, that personality, right? You're either into it or you're not. Um, but, yeah, I, I could see how boys would love that kind of stuff. Oh, Ultraman, Cayman Rider. I mean, he liked all that. I have, mm -hmm. a, big, I have a big Cayman Rider motorcycle thing in my garage. So he's a... Uh, yeah, no, he, I used to collect that stuff, too. It's cool. Now he, mm -hmm. plays, now he mm -hmm. plays video games, and I don't see him. <laughs> I know. But that's well, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a whole new era. It is. It's a whole new era. Remember when people used to have to like call each other on the phone for entertainment? <laughs> you know, ironically, like if his if their PlayStation servers are down, him and his friends will call each other on the phone so they can talk to each other while they're playing a game. But other than that, he'd be like, "My friends aren't online." It was like, "Why don't you call one of them?" I don't want to talk on the phone. It's like, God, that's how we kept in contact with people when I was young. Right. Well, now I guess for for all the fans out there, where can they find you online? Do you have a website, Twitter, Instagram, anything like that? Yes, uh, I'm under Kelly Who uh, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and Facebook. But I also have a clothing line. Oh, we we never covered this. Um, oh, let's cover so this. Thirty Three Edge. Thirty Three Edge is my new clothing line. Um, so I, I I do a lot of uh, posting about that as well. So it's a line that I developed during the um, the protests during quarantine. Um, you know, just. I, I was just so sick of, of seeing this world, this this this, this country and the, and the entire world really being so divided between left and right, you know. Um, and I, I, I had to think that there were more people that were like-minded, like myself, that that wanted unity um, and were were not polar, you know, were not on opposite scales, you know, fighting one another. So I developed this line called 33 Edge, um, uh, which really is based around unity and equality and kindness and humanity. Um, I think things that, that, that a lot of people are really searching for, reaching for these days in, in you know, this, this crazy polarized world. Where, and what's the website for that? It's 33edge.com. Um, and you can find it under 33, the number 33 Edge, uh, on Facebook and, um, and Instagram as well. You can shop directly from Instagram and Facebook. Well, I will make it a point to put a link to all that in this interview. Please do. Thank I looked you. for you on Facebook, but I couldn't find you on there. I found a page for you. Is that what it is? Uh, 33 Edge? No, I just, oh, looked for, I just looked for you on Facebook, but all I could find was a Kelly Who page. That, uh, Kelly Who fan page? That's my, that's my page. That's your page. There okay. should, I mean, there, there's gotta be, there are several. I know that there's one that's like trying to get money from people. Oh, no. Um, this is the big one. At cause... Kelly Who is me. There's only, there should only be one. Okay. Uh, verified. And that's fun. the thing, right? There, there's been a lot of people who, who are telling me, oh yeah, you know, there's somebody who's pretending to be you that, you know, is asking for money and, and um, is, is following me. And I've been having conversations with him for a year now. And, you know, there, I, there's a guy who sent a bunch of money to somebody who was impersonating me. But all people have to do is look for that check mark. I just see found if you on, I found you on Twitter and I'm following you on Twitter. I'm the... Um, Great. If you follow me back, you know I'll follow you on Instagram too. But yeah, when I I just joined Instagram a week ago, and I was like, okay, I'll just use my real name. It's like your name's in use. It was like, how is my name in use? What the hell is going on here? 
Yeah, it took me a while to be able to get my own name um, from from Instagram as well. Somebody had been sitting on it for years and not doing anything with it. Um, so I was finally able to to get the name Kelly Who, but um, but yeah, even KellyWho.com, somebody had beaten me to the punch. And um, when I did not buy the the domain from them for years, uh, they started linking it to abortion websites. Hmm. So that anybody who tried to go onto KellyWho.com would see pictures of bloody fetuses and Jesus. parts. And it was really disgusting what people do. I think a lot of people do that. They just buy up domain names and then hoping that they can sell them. Because, I mean, you can pick up a domain name for, I mean, you can pick one up for 4 to $20. They're pretty, I think I pay like 6 bucks for mine. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, so just... Uh, you know, uh, kellywho.com, kellywho.org. Well, if Kelly who wants it, she's going to have to give me $200 for it, you know, like that. So it's. Uh... Oh, no, they were demand- demanding thousands. Oh, my God. They, yeah, it's it's really a, a crappy thing that they do. You know, they really try to take advantage of actors. Um, and, uh, and so when these domains started coming up, people just started buying lists and lists of famous people. Um, hoping that one day they forced them into buying, uh, the domain. And um, and it was a big money making thing. And so you know, when I did not play the game for many many years, they uh, they started doing that. They started linking it uh, to these abortion websites. And then finally, um, after Scorpion King came out, somebody was like, "You you have to get your name, you know, because this is just you can't be letting this happen anymore." And so we had to finally cut a deal with this guy who had been sitting on my my uh, my name for many years, and uh, there's some dude out of New Jersey, and um, and yeah, we finally had to cut a deal, and I had to pay him a, a nice chunk of money just to get my own name from him, and then right after that, they made a law that you couldn't do that anymore. You should have just done realkellywho.com. But nobody looks that up. That's true. When they, yeah, and, and you know, with Scorpion King, I was just sort of coming into you know, people's attention, you know, people, a lot of people didn't know who I was. Um, and so they would look up kellyvoo.com and that's what they would find. Well, so, find, so find yeah, it, it's kind of shitty what people do, oh, um, you know, for money, taking advantage of actors who, you know, everybody thinks we're rich. Everybody thinks that because you're on television that you're automatically a millionaire. You should see some of the tweets and stuff that I get. Um, they're like, oh yeah, you know, you Hollywood elite, and what do you know? You're worth millions, and I'm like, there's a there's a site my mother like showed me. There's a site that says that I'm worth ten million dollars. I'm like, where do these people get this information? <laughs> like, what are they thinking? Um, you know, yeah, there there are some actors that are doing really really well. They've been on series for many many years, but um, but you know. Just because your face is out there does not mean that you are automatically a millionaire. That's just not the case, especially now. Actors do not get paid that well for doing guest roles and, and, and little bits here and there. It's hard to survive, you know? And so, um, and so yeah, taking advantage of, of actors who are not, uh, you know, A-list celebrities is a really shitty thing to do. I got to ask, because I'm looking at your Twitter page, because I just followed you under my other account, mutant sorceress, vampire, demon, and sometimes human. I'm going to go with vampire because you have not aged in 30 years. (laughs) You know, I think it's just being Asian, you know? I mean, look at Ming-Na, Lucy Liu. I mean, none of these girls have aged. Sandra Oh, we all kind of look the same. It's it's amazing. It's being Asian. Even, uh, who did I, uh, one of the most popular interview I've ever done, now this is a challenge, see if you can break it, is the lovely, uh, Julia Nixon. She is an HD. Oh. No, no, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, no, she's, she's great. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of, I, I remember getting interviewed once for People Magazine, the, the 50 Most Beautiful. And they tried to pretend that I was going to be on the list of actual 50 most beautiful. And then at the end of the interview, I find out that I'm only in the, um, actually, it, they didn't even tell me at the end of the interview. It wasn't until the magazine came out that I pick up the magazine and I'm not one of the 50 most beautiful. 
I'm in that one page of people who look good for their age. Oh, you should have been in the 50. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to sound creepy. You should have been in the 50 most beautiful. You're stunning. Well, there's only apparently room in that magazine for for one Asian actress at a time. So, <laughs> you know, if it makes I, you, I, my, I don't have a publicist anymore. So, so there's nobody trying to push for me, and uh, you know, I, I kind of gave up on that whole idea. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, if you, if you really made a list of of women who looked beautiful for their age, it would be filled with all Asian women. You know, women who look good for their age, it's just, it kind of comes with being Asian, right? You know, I think mostly because we're all told not to go in the sun when we're young by our parents. <laughs> I don't go in the sun because I'm tattooed, but uh, if it makes you, mm. if it makes you feel better, um, I was never in, uh, in the, even in the uh, people that look good for their age for people. So you're, you're, one, up, you're one up on me. Don't worry, it's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> It did nothing for my career. <laughs> you've had a you've had a great career, and and this has been a lot thank of fun. You. I want to thank you for taking thank so much so time much. to talk with me. I really do appreciate it. Well, I, I hope you get a good interview out of this, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and, and uh, you have a great night. This has really been fun. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to the Chronicles of Hollywood History. Thank you from Gomez Richmond Productions. <laughs>